Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the National Parents Union. It's Friday, let's see, July 17th. I don't even know the days anymore. Um, and this is the nightly restorative check-in. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Anjali Lafari, um, but I just go by Anjali. Uh, and I'm here in Arizona, um, really, sadly, one of the states that's getting bad notoriety for um, the ways that we are responding or failing to respond to this pandemic. But um, I'm gonna talk about some of the better things of it that I'm in this beautiful Sonoran desert on Otham land. Um, I'm in a town called Tempe, which is known for um, our college, our university, and ASU, uh, which is where I graduated from. But I'm also a professor. Uh, at a local community college. So this show is the brainchild, the brainchild of Marisol Quevedo Arerucha, um, somebody who I regard as my comadre, as my dear friend. Uh, and she lets me come in on Fridays and host. Um, and I'm so happy to do that. And so uh, just blessed with my relationship with the National Parents Union. So um, I know, at least for me, on Fridays, it, I think of it as a wind down time. Um, I think about like relaxing, connecting, kicking off my shoes, watching something enjoyable with my family and our friends. Uh, and so that was also kind of the thought behind the show being a social emotional check in for parents, for families and for, you know, any caregivers. But Isol brought me on to the show early on at the at the beginnings of it, and um, she brought me on because I'm a psychologist, hypnotherapist, and also, as I already said, a professor. And on that show, uh, because I have a background in meditation, I taught a, a breathing technique called 478. So I want to maintain the integrity of the way that Marisol runs the show, because ever since um, I taught that technique, she's continued with it um, every day that she comes on, which is now Mondays and Wednesdays, right? And then I round out the week with Friday. So let me explain 478. Let's start with that, and then we'll move into kind of some other introductions. 478 is a breathing pattern. And so what you do is you inhale for four seconds, you hold your breath for seven seconds and then you exhale for eight seconds. That is a longer exhale. So you want to try to control your breath and push it out for those full eight seconds. We'll do that cycle of breathing four times around and I'll count it out for you. So you don't have to do the counting, right? You don't have to remember if at any point you get lost, just want to encourage you to go back to your normal breath pattern and then rejoin us on the inhalation because uh, remember we're doing it four times the other little tidbits i would say is i'd encourage you to close your eyes if that's comfortable for you or or if you're in a place where that's possible um, if you're not i encourage you to at least uh, look downward or restrict kind of all the visual distractions that could come at you. Um, our visual, uh, our visual sense is the one that's most dominant for the majority of us. And it's all, that also means that we can get distracted if just somebody walks into the room or something simple crosses our visual field. The last thing I say always is, you know, I encourage people to uncross their body. And so, you know, uh, when we think about body language, if somebody's kind of in a position crossed, you know, their arms are crossed, we think about them as not being open to the, to the material or to the content. So, you know, if you want to get the most out of it, like I said, kind of put position yourself in an open posture. All right. So many words. <laughs> okay. So, Let's start, right? So go ahead and find the body position that you want to be in. Start by taking your normal breaths, kind of getting yourself ready for a longer breath and a long, even longer exhale. And on this next breath, I'm gonna encourage you to inhale for four, three, two, one, hold for four, excuse me, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Exhale for eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Inhale for four, three, two, one. Hold for seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, 
Exhale for eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Inhale for four, three, two, one. Hold for seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Release for eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Inhale for our last cycle, three, two, one. Hold for seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and release for eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, and one. Take a natural breath. Hopefully, even despite my mistake, you still feel like you arrived, right? Um, done properly, kind of what I, the feeling that I tend to experience so that I know that I've entered re a relaxation response and moved out of a stress or a sympathetic response is maybe you can take a bit fuller breath. Maybe you notice that your shoulders have dropped. Uh, maybe you've noticed that you are yawning or you feel a little tired and relaxed or you've produced tears out of the corners of your eye. These are all markers that our body um, uses or has when we've entered a relaxation response. And for you nerds who want uh, a scientific term, it's called the parasympathetic system. So, and let me tell on myself. So the reason why I messed up on that first seven um, is because I was teaching somebody a different breathing technique today that involved a different set of counting. So I confused myself, but hopefully you all recovered with me. Um, and as always, I just appreciate you all for like the grace that not only that you give me, but I think that we all just give one another, right? Such a good example. We're all parents, we're all trying to figure stuff out. Um, and so that's one of the things that I've loved the most about NPU um, is being able to kind of find different aspects of who I am, right? As a professional, as a mom, um, and I, do it live on camera. All right, so let me kind of finish saying a little bit more about myself. You know, this is my third show where I'm hosting, right? You all, some of you are used to seeing me in the mornings on the Spanish show. Um, I'm originally from Southern California and uh, I've talked about my dad quite a bit. So my father, it, he, he's passed away, he was Cuban. So we have Taino, Arawak and African roots. My mother is from Guatemala, so that's Maya territory. territory. You've met my brother, you've met my sister, Rodimus and Leilani. Um, I've also talked about that I'm a mom and I have a 20-year-old daughter. Uh, and another identity that's really important to me and one that I'm actually probably going to speak about a little more today, um, which I haven't mentioned before, is that I'm a widow. Um, also, another really important identity right outside of my professional identity and my family identity are the relationships that I have in this community, right? You heard me acknowledge, right, the Sonoran Desert and, the Otham, and that I'm on Otham land. Um, the reason why I do that is because I'm a member of the Siwa Patli Collective. Um, actually, next week, we'll have somebody from my collective on the show. But we focus a lot on indigenous mothering, and we support women and their families, uh, we say, from womb to tomb. So like I said, that all, that's another, uh, it's the people that I pray with and another identity that um, it will, I'll expose you to uh, next week. But for today, I'm so excited, you guys. I'm bursting. Uh, I cannot wait to introduce you all uh, after I introduce Dr. Atira Charles. Um, there are a, a host of things that she does, and I will, you know, read them off to you. For me, why I'm excited is because she's my best friend. Um, and we all, you know, both she and I are people who have a lot of best friends. Um, it, this is the, the, you know, the cream of the crop best friend, the one that's kind of seen you through a lot of different points in your life. So professionally, 
Dr. Achira Charles is a diversity thought leader. She's an author. She's the CEO of the Charles Consulting Group. She has her PhD in business and organizational behavior here from ASU. We'll tell that story, right? That's how we met. Uh, she's a former professor both at Florida State University and Florida uh, FAMU. Um, she's a mother of three children as well. So I really want to welcome Dr. Atir Charles into our little room and space here for this nightly restorative check-in. So we'll give her a second to come in and um, we're going to do our best to, you know, be our professional selves. Uh, but I think what's going to end up happening is that you're going to hear hopefully some incredibly fun stories from graduate school days um, and just from all of the times that we've spent together. So uh, for whatever reason, it's taking a second for her to come in. So I'm just going to start telling you some stories actually about Atira. So we actually met in 2004. Uh, we met here at, let's see, we met here, I'm getting a message that they're, they're adding her in and it's just taking a second to slide her over, so Zoom things. But anyway, so we met in 2004, we met here um, at ASU, and um, the, one of the interesting things <laughs> about our friendship is that most people would have thought in our first year of graduate school that she and I lived together because she was at my house so often. Um, and when I kind of tell you all about, you know, her being really instrumental to my identity um, as a widow, um, I want to share that. Um, so she, I have two friends. Uh, two friends that I've known for this long, right, for 16 years, and both Dr. Tira Charles and also this other friend, they actually met my husband before I met him, um, and because we were all here in graduate school together. And, you know, it was only by a couple of days, right? But, you know, when I said, oh, yeah, I met this person, blah, 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 right? They're like, oh, yeah, we already know this guy, right? We've already met him. And so through that, um, through that meeting, um, you know, obviously things happened, right? We became, you know, we entered into a relationship and we were married for about five years. Uh, excuse me, I'm, let me say this. We were in a relationship for five years. We were actually only married for seven months. Um, and Atira was a big part of our wedding. She sang at our wedding. Uh, but I, when I describe the level of friendship that we have, uh, besides her being right in my wedding, um, Sorry, I'm just looking at the messages they're trying to get her in. But anyway, besides her being at my wedding, um, the ways that I think I define our friendship is how she was with me when he was sick. So he passed away from cancer. Um, and you all have, you know, some of you have heard me talk about my dad and that my dad also passed away from cancer. Um, th this was actually kind of, it was at the same time. So my father died on June 28th and my husband died on June 29th. Um, so then anyway, so what happened is that Atira would call me, she would call me and she would say, hey, you know, I was in the hospital with my husband and she would say, hey, um, I'm a little worried about you. And I would say, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. It's okay. You know, um, because I had a lot of stress around the fact that people were kind of taking care of and, you know, caring for my dad and his family, right? Um, and that I couldn't be there. And so anyway, so Atira was that constant person. She would tell me, I'm having dreams, I'm having dreams about you and that you're not okay, right? And I wanna check on you. So finally, when we knew what was happening, right? And we knew that my, um, you know, that people were going to pass away, here she is. That's in, we're, I'm gonna keep telling the story until you end, there you go. Now I just gotta finish the story. Finish the but story, I, girl. But let me say hi to you. Okay. <laughs> this is Dr. Dear Charles, anyway. Okay. So anyway, I was trying to stretch it, girl. Okay. So anyway, so um, she would call me when we knew that things were going on. So Atira was in Florida because she had moved because she started her job at FSU. And um, she came to Texas, which is where we were. There's a long story of why. We didn't live in Texas. We were in Texas. And so this woman stayed with me. My car was in Texas, drove to California because we had to go to funeral proceedings, right, for my dad. Then my husband's family uh, is from Arkansas. Then we flew to Arkansas. She flew with me. Um, and then from there, then she returned back and drove back to Florida. So when I say that there, 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 there are friends and then there are friends that, like, if for some reason 
you messed yourself and you like couldn't take care of yourself, that somebody would help you clean up. That's who Atira is for me. Um, she's been my shield at like the most difficult times in my life. And oh, we will cry in two seconds if we go there. Um, but I anyway, know. hello, Dr. Charles. Hi, and Dr. friend, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Good, you know, I think the universe does things. I think the universe needed me to hear you tell that story without me in the, in the field, so yes. <laughs> well, cause you would have cried. So like in two exactly. seconds. One, but also, no, you know, it's good for me too, because you know, you know me better than anyone else. Um, I struggle sometimes with being vulnerable uh, in the moment. So the one thing that is weird is that people will hear me like I can share, I can tell you all my stories, but it's once I wrapped my mind around it. And so, and this is now 11 years ago. So I've had time, but um it's unique, you know, it's, it, this grief has been very private and there's not as much space to talk about when your husband, you've lost a husband as much as there's space that I have to talk, feel like I can talk about my father and things like that. So, yes. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's so interesting. Um, hey everybody, it's a pleasure to be here on the show. And it's so wild, you know, I, I do a lot of corporate trainings for diversity and inclusion stuff. So all week I've been on Zooms talking about all things work, right? Trying to tell everybody not to be a racist and how to be an ally. But, um, so this feels different and special because there's not a lot of times that our personal and professional lives get to interact, right? So like all week I've taught people about be authentic, be vulnerable, be transparent. Let's create courageous spaces and brave and safe spaces. And so this is the perfect way to like end the week um, with us doing the things we've been telling people to do um, all week. So even in you telling that story, it just brings me back to that time. And, you know, sometimes we live, we live out parts of our lives that we're almost outside of and we watch it from the outside. And that's a chapter of our lives that anytime we think about it, it feels like a movie we were in um, until we start talking about it. And so this is the first time I think we've talked about this specific thing in a while. Um, Cause so much life of course has occurred in 11 years. And um, so it, it's also like on the other side of that, the irony is um, Anjali and I met on the first day of our student training in a diversity and inclusion <laughs> um, workshop that was super bad FYI. Like they needed <laughs> us to teach it even when we were students. So we bonded through like looking at each other across the room as like the two brown girls in the room like did they just say like is this we did and you liked it you know it's funny because you like to tell that part of the story and the story the part of the story that i attached to is like how the second we locked eyes we it was like it was like the cartoons with hearts it's like it was it was and so okay actually hold on so let me do a good job of like how i try to tell this story is that so many times, so you guys know I'm a psychologist, so many times we talk about attraction and we only think about it in romantic, romantic attraction, but you guys, attraction is period. You are attracted to, meaning you are called to, you are compelled, right? To talk to, to initiate a relationship with or a conversation with a ship with a person. And that can be in friendship. And that is exactly what happened. Like, uh, and so in this way, you're right. I agree with you. Like whatever stars and magical fairy dust that like, that somebody, you know, something decided to kind of sprinkle down on us, like it happened and we felt it and we literally never separated since. So I don't know if you heard me, I was, I was talking about how like the whole first year, uh, you halfway lived at my house. Mm -hmm. and, and you know what's so <laughs> wild about that is, you know, if you think about even less our adult motherhood lives now, we watch, we talk often about our kids and how they have like a best friend. My son has a best, I have twin boys that are eight and a 13 year old daughter. And they have a common best friend. Her name is Trinity. And the other day I was talking about something personal and I heard noise. They just keep Trinity on the iPad. So Trinity's just like a fixture in our house at this point. And I was like, guys, you have to let me know when Trinity's just sitting in audio land. And so, but we were like that. Like we just kept each other there. And we didn't have to be doing anything. We would just sit on the couch for hours and just be. And you know, so often as adults, I think as parents, especially as mothers, I think we miss those days where we could just sit on the couch with our bestie. And I think especially during this pandemic time, 
we miss that even more, especially with everybody in the house all the time, you know? And so I think back to that time, anytime I want to go to a special place of just doing nothing with a person you love, that's your bestie, you know? And so I appreciate, even in pandemic time, FaceTime has become that for us, but I just charge people watching to try to find ways to create and recreate that sentiment, right? Like Absolutely. the name of the show is restored. Like it does something for us. Exactly. And I think we have to honor it instead of thinking, oh, we're adults, we don't need that anymore. Like when I think about my sons, Keith and Trinity on the iPad, there's a comfort to that, that, that matters to them. And it's the same thing with us as adults. And right now, and so you and I have talked about this and I think in a, you know, well, in a second, I do want to move into our professional sides or your professional side in particular, but um, so I have this theory, I'll just put it out there, right? That I think there are like three things, three main components that I think um, people who are able to harness these three things are kind of able for sure surviving and maybe even thriving a little bit, right? during this pandemic. So essentially one of social connection, right? The use of technology and then practicality, right? And so mm -hmm. I feel like you're really speaking to social connection and how we're being pushed and forced, right? To maintain this connection with one another through whatever means necessary, which right now is primarily technology. But you and I also have privilege, right? Um, we have the yes. privilege of having access and resources to all these things. And certainly somebody who's not thriving or during this time frame, um, I think it's just, you know, it's such an example right, of usually lack of privilege or lack of means and resources. And you know what's interesting about that? Like, even when you say social connection, I think that's one of the things we're dealing with in the larger society too, right? What I like to call the social shift that happened six weeks ago. And I'm sticking to that very generic language of it because we don't know what it was. We can't say it was an awakening yet. We can't say it was, it, it was a shift. And we'll see how we keep defining what the shift <laughs> is over time. But I think that there was a social connectivity that happened during the pandemic quarantine that softened people to be able to hear different, mm. right? People, I think, were talking to people in their lives more than we usually would. Sitting connected to narratives on TV and the news more than we usually would. Um, and then when the social shift happened, you know, I, with the work that I do, be it in education spaces, corporations, municipalities, law enforcement agencies, there is a conversation around how do we create alignment, right? How, how do we connect? How do we come together? And it is connection, but so often in the workplace, people like to say, you keep work, work, and you keep home, home. But then there's words that emerge in society, like, oh, that's my work husband, oh, that's my work wife, or that's my work bestie. And we feel the need to kind of put that caveat on it. When in theory, what we're saying is those are the people that we can be vulnerable, transparent with, share our lived experiences with in a way that develops trust. And I think what's happening now is everybody was such a mess for a couple of months that everyone is just willing to just open up more in a different way, which is, I think, helping with some of the race stuff, the gender stuff, and all that. And what you're oh, saying is, that I'm sorry, what you're saying is we need it, you know? And so, yeah. sorry guys, you can hear my dog walking along the floor here, but um, we need it, you know, we're realizing how much, and some of us are realizing how little we need that connection. And you and I talk about that all the time because you and I are very different in our needs for touch. And we have- um, I need all the things. I need all the things. I need the touch. I need friend hugs. I need kisses, I need a rub on my leg, I need a phone call, I need FaceTime call, I need all the texts, I need all the emojis, all the exclamation points. She does, she does. So that's, you already know like how I'm gonna thank you, right, you know? So whenever, whenever, and so we should also say you're in Florida. So we are both in the states that are just acting up, right, as it relates to not listening to CDC guidelines, yes. uh, not implementing them. So anyway, whenever we, you're like on the list, you know, like uh, I got two trips, like at least that I need to make and Florida is one of them and it's to see you and all of my God babies. Um, so yes, that's going to happen. Okay. So let's, you were starting to talk about work, right? And you were starting to talk about, which I appreciate, right? What you're, that I love, I love how you said it, that basically 
the pandemic softened us, right? So distress, mm -hmm. right? Calamity, the sad that that's what it takes, but it softened us to be able to hear. And that's actually what I think is the most important part of what you said. Um, all week on the Spanish show, I've been talking about like kind of socially responsible corporations. So I'm interested in your thoughts about that and we can bring up examples. But I also want you to talk about you like set up you know, this idea that we wear a mask sometimes at work and sometimes we take it off and you're the author of a book that is related to this topic. So can you inform us of that? Yes, so when Anjali and I were getting our PhDs, like we said day one, we're like, here's what we know. Like we're, we're smart, we're the smart girls, but we know we are getting this degree for a reason. And we're getting this degree so that we can say all the things that we already know we want to say, and no one can say we don't know what we're saying because we have a PhD. Like we were very clear from the beginning on our why. And so for me, um, studying diversity still seemed very light. Like I didn't like necessarily the narratives around it. But once I dug deeper, I was like, oh, this is an identity conversation. And in a lot of the organizational workplace management leadership literature, it was just like quantitative, like, oh, when this happens, this is what black people do, this is what white people do. I'm like, no, 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 there's an experience, there's a feeling, there's something deeper going on. So there's a poem that mattered to me by Paul Lawrence Dunbar called We Wear the Mask. And that guided a lot of my thinking and my work, so much so in my first academic paper, my district, my, my advisor then, she was like, we are scholars and academics. We do not start scholarly papers with poems. I was like, well, listen, this poem sets the stage in a way that no other academic reference does. And I just stuck and kept to it. And we giggle about it now. She's like, and now you're like known all over for this thing. And I could have like stopped you. So we, we joke about that. But everything I've done since then is framed in this narrative of identity and the masks that we wear. And so often we think about masks as like, what hides what we hide and what we conceal and what we suppress. But masks are really just metaphors for all the different identities we have. Some are authentic, some are not, right? And oftentimes we focus on the ones that are not authentic, but there's room to talk about what is authentic and shifting in and out as long as we have a piece about what we're shifting in and out with. So I started something called the Mask Project where I started collecting the narratives of people of color, and their experience of wearing the mask at work and in life. And at this point now we have like 3000 narratives and it really has, it, I would speak at conferences and afterwards people would say, I'm Dr. Charles, can I talk to you for a second? I'm like, sure, why are we whispering? And then they would tell me some story. And I was like, we have to start capturing these stories because people are not talking about it. And so I, started doing work and I created this concept of the art of unmasking, right? Like what is the art of taking these masks off to be honest with ourselves, to be self-aware, to be um, self-reflective, to be introspective? How do we cope with the fact that wearing these masks takes a toll on us, is a burden, if not managed effectively? And so then that led me to doing the book called The Art of Unmasking, Peeling the Bit. What is my book called? Peeling Back the Layers <laughs> to Maximize Personal and Professional Success, right? So what does it mean to impact our... I, I refused to accept the ideology that work is work and life is life. Mm -hmm. So all of the work that I've done to date is the intersection of it. Because our, our minds and our hearts don't change. And in, in the language we use, our spirits don't change when we walk in and out of work. We bring it all there. And people, I think, have learned to compartmentalize and suppress instead of revealing and having peace about what they're revealing. Now, the reality is, is there's risk to that, too, especially as people of color, to share all of that vulnerability, too. So, you know, I'm wondering because your work, you know, had you paused, right? You paused at the beginning of the pandemic. And, and let's actually, I, I want to give context, right? So you were a professor and you actually right before the pandemic left your the very a very steady paycheck right to go into uh 100 professional consulting right around issues of diversity in the workplace and in mm -hmm. education space we got the pandemic stuff shut down for a little bit and then now we're in what what I think later on might be called like post George Floyd era, you know, and right. appropriately called where diversity, equity, and inclusion, and what I would say this movement to justice, right? Yes. Is so prominent. So like 
your stuff shut down and then now I imagine you I, I know we spoke like it's been a marathon week how are the how is thing how are things looking different and how is that math work playing itself out now yes yeah, so 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 often I focused the, the unmasking work on people of color because one that was just a passion point right and I think that's the, that was a skill set and a, co a set of coping skills and resources that people of color women any one of a stereotype stigmatized identity or oppressed identity needed um, disenfranchised identity but guess how it shifted though I'm doing a lot of white people unmasking mm -hmm. right because of course, people of color, it's like, uh, nothing new has happened, so. There's nothing to right? reveal, you're just seeing what was already there. Exactly, but what is happening is white people at work are like, oh my gosh, Johnny, I know, I see on TV that there's people who are afraid to run down the street for a run in the morning because the cop could shoot them, but like, that happens to you too? And so there's this personalization I'm observing. And I do these trainings all day, every day since all this happened, right? And I'm seeing a true authentic amongst white people at work. That I am imagining. To... Go ahead. I'm sorry, I'm imagining you didn't see before when you were doing all these trainings. Oh, no, 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 no. It didn't have the same. No, it definitely didn't have a, oh, it had a, oh, really? Mm. You sure? It was a lot of questioning. Now I think that white ears and hearts and minds are just hearing different at work like they're choosing to be silent and hear versus before they would be like but could it have been that because you know there's times i've gotten pulled over before and right now it's just it's this it's a more active listening it is and um and that feels good to know and then what i'm also seeing on the side of black people and people of color they're using these town halls and courageous conversations to tell the truth. And those are truths that we have not given them pr the privilege of hearing in truth and authenticity um, and in a vulnerable way. And so, I mean, I, I mean, every other session I do, there's somebody crying off of an experience. So it could be the white VP of HR who just feels guilty about not seeing certain things or believing certain things before. It could be the the black man who finally told a story that every time he goes into a boardroom, he notices people clench up. It could be the Asian woman today, for example, who I was talking about being the model minority and the expectation that Asians are super smart and really good with math and that there's a negative consequence that comes along with that expectation too. And she chimed into the Zoom, went on her video and started talking and crying right there. And that softened people. So I think we're showing emotion more. So there's yes. people like me that are super emotional and emotional all the time. And now I think there's people that are starting to show and tap those parts of themselves in an authentic way that's doing something really beautiful. So I, I, I can't help but like, you know, I think in symbols quite a bit, just given my spiritual nature and obviously my psychological nature, how is your metaphor gonna change? from unmasking or, you know, and, and not to rewrite your book, but I, I'm seeing some natural metaphors <laughs> come about here. How is that changing? Yeah, and, and I, think that, I think the metaphor stays the same. I think now, I think that white people are gaining new masks they didn't have before, authentic ones. So it's shifting from, I've been in my power privilege space, now I'm moving into ally space. I've been in my blinder space. Now I'm moving to an awareness space. Um, I was in a not being vulnerable. Now I'm choosing to be more vulnerable. And so it's almost like there are new, new masks and identities that I think our white counterparts are building. And then I also think that people of color and black employees are shedding some. So there's this, there's this balance, right? So there's this release happening on one end and this kind of pulling things in on the other end. And that's very different than we've ever seen. Yeah, and, and, and you know, as, I, as you talk about it, it's at the forefront, you know, we're trying to describe something that's like occurring, right, in real time. Um, and so yes. I guess in some ways there's a part of my question that's a little unfair, you know, but I mean, really, I mean, I, but I, I thought of like, I think of uncloaking, you know, I think of like kind of removing, right, versus, um, yes, I can see how, right, 
um, marginalized folks, right, POC folk, people of color, how they're more so able to, like you said, step in, right, step into yeah. their identity and be more of who, who they are. There is a permission. There is a permission yes. to tell our stories, um, and which is important. And some people know. need, and some people need external permission. So for example, like to pull it personal for a minute, you and I are the most, we don't need external permission people up, like, all we need is our own and each other to be like, yeah, girl. And we are on it, right? We also are the type of people that are okay with having masks or identities that may conflict. Right. You know, I won't tell them our John Legend groupie story during finals week, but like we, <laughs> like, we make choices, okay? When we want to do what we want to do and somehow we've gotten it all done. But when we want to do something, we want to do something. And what I'm now realizing as we approach our 40-ish space, um, that's a privilege we have that I'm realizing other people don't. Like we're in a minority of being unapologetically writing the scripts of our lives, whether kind of people like it or not, independently in a secure way. Like that is not the norm and I think that those of us that are like that have something to show and model for the people around us and even pulling it back to NPU, like for especially parents, like giving parents permission in this moment to tap a lot of different parts of who they are, redefine parts of who they are. A lot in my life has changed in 2020 that is redefining me in a lot of different ways. And I'm okay with that because I'm okay with evolution but I've always been okay with it. Some people feel like evolution is bad and, and, and then resist it, but this is a moment where society has to evolve. Like everybody, like we can't do it in silos anymore. Everybody has to decide that transformation and change matters and redefining self matters. So let me, there's so many ways I wanna go with that, but let me, you know, I. I I feel like we would be remiss if we didn't hear how you see that happening kind of within professional space and business space, because, you know, one thing, yes, I told you her bio, but um, you guys, you know, Atira consults for Fortune 500 companies, right, for uh, educational institutions in different countries, right, for professional, um, uh, professional athletic organizations. So, you know, I don't know, however you want, to, whomever you want to explain you work for. Um, how is this shift, this change, looking at the top C-suite levels um, of corporations? So the first thing that I've been telling CEOs and execs is like, let's, okay, so <laughs> getting a little personal here again. So I'm super smart with what I do and I'm good at my job. But do you know what I'm realizing, I think, is an asset right now in this season? I hmm. think I'm the black friend nobody has that speaks the truth mm. in these C-suite conversations. Like mm. these are, there's truths that I'm speaking that they literally have never heard before, which is mind boggling, right? Cause you're talking 50 something, 60 something year old people. Um, and so I would just charge everybody with like, give the truth because they're ready to hear it. Okay, so back to what I'm telling them. Okay. Resource, resource, resource. If you're not budgeting in, the resources to do all this work, just having a bunch of conversations is not enough. Just doing one training is not enough. It has to be some type of engaged, um, long-term, multi-touch point learning system. I told them, I said, did anybody in here go to therapy for one day and leave and say, I'm done? Did anyone go to college for one day or one even semester or one year and say, I'm done? Like this concept that organizations have said, oh, we just need this one moment and all of a sudden we've learned. It's like, no, that's BS. And so that's what I'm challenging organizations with now. You, you say you want this outcome. We make these amazing debts. What's the action on it? What's the accountability on it? And then the, the big to-do question, what are the consequences you're willing to give to hold your people accountable? Right, right. And so, and what I think about is that that's what was going on before, right? That because there wasn't a critical mass, and that term means a lot to me, which is what I think we're seeing right now, right? There are these moments in history and in time, sorry guys, my dog just came over and 
pulled off my bracelets. Anyway, so I'm trying to recover. But anyway, um, so there are these moments in time where there's just like steam, right? We can push the ball forward. We can, anyway, lots of examples. But take advantage of that because I know I feel that in my professional spaces that people are listening, you know? Um, oh, yes. And listening, listening and almost urgent to the point. I had to tell someone earlier, I said, VP of HRX, racism isn't going anywhere. We don't have to book it next week. Like, we can do this in September too. Like, we can, and so there is this urge because I think what executives are feeling is, I don't want to, I don't want them to think I'm not listening, so let's get it done now. Whereas before, it would be, I'd meet someone at a conference in July. They say, oh, Doc, we definitely want to bring you in. It could any month, it could be December, January. There was no sense of why we need to do it now or soon. Now everybody is like, what's your first opening? Right. And now I'm at the point I don't even like have openings for real until September. You get what I mean? Um, and so the, my concern, my concern is that organizations are going to get burned out right now having all these multiple diversity inclusion council meetings and multiple talks and these throwing everything at the first thing they can. And then now October is going to hit. And then either everyone's going to act like it's gone, like we did with the pandemic for a couple of months, or everyone's going to be like, oh, shoot, we just over-resourced things that may not have given us the impact that we truly need long-term. Yes. And go ahead. No, I was saying, and my concern is actually, uh, so this is something that I saw REI, um, and, and, and I'm calling them out in a good way and calling them in, right? They, I saw on Instagram, they have, you know, kind of their 10 slide, this is what we're doing, right, to kind of look at ourselves, be self-reflective and adjust our organization and the relationships we have to community. And so then there, you know, like anything in social media, right, so there are some people saying, hey, cool, and by the way, I wrote you an email a long time ago, or I contacted you a long time ago, and you still haven't addressed X, Y, Z. So my fear is that, that the companies, and anyone, anyone putting themselves out there, there's only so much we will sit in ambiguity and discomfort before we retreat and say, oh, see, I tried and that wasn't worth it. But if they don't have the proper tools, if they don't have the building blocks, right, which is what you're saying, if right. they don't this is just like a long haul change, right? As yeah. soon as it gets hard, they're going to back up. And that's what scares me. Well, here's where I feel a little bit optimistic with that now. <laughs> the Black and people of color employees in these spaces are not backing up. And honestly, I didn't even tell a Black exec the other day. I said, listen, they're hearing. They hear you. They called me. They signed the contract. Okay? <laughs> but... Like, give them some room to breathe for a second, right? Like, so many of the execs got these manifestos of, like, 100 things and demands. And it's like, all of that can't happen at one time. It has to be dissected. It has to be understood, right? It has to be prioritized and ranked. And let's be clear, they need someone externally to do that because they haven't been able to do it themselves before anyway. So I've been using the language of marathon versus sprint. And I think everybody emotionally wants to sprint right now for the Olympic gold. Right. And we have to see this as a marathon on both ends. Corporate activists have to kind of bring it back a bit so we don't burn out by October 2. I think the, the leaders have to kind of sit in it for a minute and assess. And so I think everyone needs to just kind of like breathe and sit for a second because this hyper vigilance, I'm seeing it have I'm seeing organizations make moves that are not necessarily the things that will create the outcome in the long term. And I, I believe that it's a learning and awareness game, but it's also a culture climate assessment game. Yes. And that takes time. And so like if I were to kind of say, you know, in, in my words, I would say I wanna I wanna tell employees, parents, right? Um, people in education space, spaces who don't have the decision-making power is to be strategic but consistent with your pressure, right? You know, so like yes. pick, 
like pick what's the all right well like I, I i do i feel this in my campus like it's the time that like i i always get listened to you know like you already know but anyway, but <laughs> but even more right you know i feel the weight of my voice and so i'm trying to be really thoughtful then about what it is that i'm recommending or suggesting or asking for so be strategic with the pressure but then also know that it's like it's it's turning the titanic you know and so right. it's gonna take a second for all parts of the organization to get on board and that like your heart your belief system can maybe change which typically that was the part that was harder to change typically it was initiatives that changed and then we all kind of caught up in our minds and our hearts this is the complete reverse right some of us are mm -hmm. changing internally and then we're waiting for the externals to change yes and and there's a lot of baggage everyone's pulling in right so I did a TED talk um, in October, I think that was, um, Link called Re, look, all these titles I have to like, think about on Friday night, um, <laughs> Rethinking Diversity and Inclusion as a Health and Wellness Dilemma. So if you go to YouTube, um, you put in Dr. Atira Charles' TED talk, it'll come up. Um, but the reason that I decided to do that topic, and of course, this was before any, this was before the pandemic hit, this was before social shift hit, um, maybe I'm psychic or something, but <laughs> I knew that diversity and inclusion and health and wellness were about to collide. I just mm. did. I mm. could have talked on a lot of things when I tried. And I told you, I was like, I could go yeah. a lot of directions. I said, but I'm being called to talk about the intersection of how people are about to hit a wall and it's about to wear them out. And I felt a need to make a public call to action around that. And we're seeing it happen. Um, so definitely everybody check that, check it out. I think it's pretty cool. <laughs> so talk about that really fast. Like, so what's, um, yeah, how, how would you recommend that folks at all levels, you know, cause ultimately we are individuals in our social spaces, right? What should individuals be doing to care for themselves, given the heightenedness of the racial identity space, just the social justice space, their identity and kind of the intersection of that socially? So the first word I'll use starts with a G and it's called grace. I think that we have so much pressure that we put on ourselves to get it right all the time, very quick. And I don't think culturally we give ourselves enough grace to like sit in things. Now, back to personal for a second. Me and Anjali have no problem sitting in something. It has delayed some things in our life. <laughs> We have procrastinated on many a thing as we give ourselves all the grace. Um, so there's, there's, there's levels, but I do think that people are not giving themselves grace to feel and grace to feel frustrated and grace to take off the mask of perfectionism and black and brown excellence all the time. Like the messy human part of us, like it has a room and it needs to come out for a second you know, to give the other parts of us ourselves space. I love that you started off with a breathing technique. People need to find their breath. Mm -hmm. We are in such a rat race mode that people aren't stopping to even relax your shoulder, relax your jaw and breathe. So people need to become aware of that. I'd even beg to say, moving into more Eastern healing types of approaches. So for, for me, so I had some anxiety challenges a couple of years ago that I had to deal with. And it was because I had too many loads without enough resources and didn't have a system around me. Okay, some childhood stuff too. But I'm just saying like at, the, at that point, I needed some more resources to match this heavy load of work and life and family and all of that that I was balancing. So that I found my breath at that time. And so now when I know something's off is when my breath goes left or right. And so I think people need to start focusing on that to know when they're in flow versus when they're in hustle. And I think we've pushed to this very hustle, hustle, grind, grind mentality. And I think we need to get into more of like a flow and alignment. Absolutely. Give ourselves permission. Um, you know, you'll, <laughs> you'll be proud of me actually. Um, so yesterday, you know, it, normally you and I have more touch points of talking, but our lives have gotten busy. So yesterday I actually did that. I took about half a day off, you know, um, all the Good. way yeah into into like about 1 p.m ish you know because i was dealing with something you know had an emotional reaction to something um too long to explain i was good in the afternoon i got bad again 
life got bad again and then people checked on me you know um people called me and then i had these already built in mechanisms because through the collective i had a check-in and stuff like that so yeah it's i feel like yesterday i lived actually exactly what you're suggesting and it, it's helpful and i i needed it geez i need like there was no option right and that's the thing like how you said the waves of the day that's mm -hmm. where we have to give each other grace to. So it's like, wait, I woke up good. I'm having a good day. And then we, we get mad at ourselves for having a bad hour or having a tough hour. Let's even take the word bad off. Having a tough hour or a frustrated hour or ambiguous hour, mm -hmm. you know? And so for me, like, that's my plan tomorrow. My plan tomorrow is to just sit yeah. and not talk. I'll probably only talk to you and like another best year or two and that's it tomorrow. You know what I mean? Like, I don't have capacity to talk about anything that requires me to pull from here. And I, get, I told myself I'm giving myself the day. And so we have to schedule, this sounds crazy, you have to schedule your downtime. It's because right crazy. now we feel so, we're so emotionally aroused about everything mm -hmm. that we're not taking the moments to take the step back. Absolutely. So yeah, and, and you're in there, I can hear it's that, social connection, right? Having people like, and you, and I would say, and you don't have to be connected to everyone. You just need a few for yeah. people because there's too much going on. So it's okay to disengage from and not have the, the, the 10 people that you would normally check in, you know? So I'll say right. like, two people checked in on me yesterday and, and I'm so thankful for them. And there wasn't anything special short of like, friendship right and they were there at the right time and i'm so grateful and they're so important to me and then the next time it'll be someone else and then another day i'll do it for them exactly so it doesn't have to be on 10 for everyone i know i can't be on 10 right now i'm really needing a lot of time to myself because things are so intense and I right know you're in and you know with with a variety of things that have gone on in my life in the last couple of months i've noticed my friends checking in on me more than usual i mean you guys know i'm the hey 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 usually People probably feel my distance more during this season as I'm recalibrating a lot of things. You know what I mean? But I appreciate the, the inbound, <laughs> right? Like you said, like when it comes inbound and someone's like, hey girl, how you doing? Just checking in on you. It's like, oh, even if I can't get back to you in that moment, it does something to know that you're being seen and felt by people that you love. And I think people have to also, sometimes we're connected to the people that can't do the thing for us that we need them to do in the moment. And we have to give grace to those people too, and then actively connect with the who can for that thing in that moment, in that hour, for that day. Yes. You know? And, yeah, and I, and I just, I think so much is changing right now that like, appreciate, but don't like, don't foreclose. Like it's not permanent. It's not gonna be like that forever. And this, like not everyone who's checking in on you right now is gonna be there for the long haul, the same situation, the same job, the same pressure is not gonna be there. But I think, so then what's permanent and what are we learning? We're learning to cope, we're learning to evolve, we're learning to kind of work our feelings, right? We're learning different techniques. Um, that's the stuff that's gonna be enduring, right? If you can hang on to it, and hopefully the people hang on, but you know, like it's 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 just right. Right. It's right. And then and and you also have to know where your time. Another suggestion I give is what's your time of day where you're your tightest. So mm -hmm. some people ruminate at night. Some people is midday when things are building. I realized I had my big aha this week. It's the mornings for me. The first twenty minutes of waking up, I feel like the stress hormones in my stomach. I am thinking about the day. It is my most intense, emotionally reactive moment of the day, the first 20 minutes. And what do we usually do? Just lay there the first 20 minutes. So what well, I started- to Grab our phones. I'm gonna say, stop grabbing your that phones. That too, that too. So what I started doing was, so I started not pulling my phone, then realized, oh shoot, that's just making me rabbit hole even more. I said, I need a healthier way to distract. So what I started doing was getting up as soon as I woke up, mm. drinking some water, to get my body moving, playing my sound bowls, listening to a certain song or two. And what it does is it, it pulls my, if my body woke up kind of, it just pulls me back to center and then I'm good for the rest of the day. I mean, you know me, I don't sit in any specific emotion long, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I just realized that the weight of the world hits me in that first 20 minutes. Yeah, yeah. And then I feel through it, I own it, and then I let it pass through.
And I think that we have to, as a society, learn to let it pass through better. Yes. Um, I'm a master compartmentalizer. It's a good thing and a bad thing sometimes. But, <laughs> but, I, it. Yeah. Right. but right now, what I, I'm clear whether I'm compartmentalizing or not, this is how my body is reacting to the current state of the world. So I have to make sure there's a 20 minutes I get it right. Yes. It's yeah. those 20 minutes. Perfect. Well, you know, obviously I could talk to you for days, um, but that, you know, this magic clock, this, this invisible thing called time is running across us. Um, I just want to give you the opportunity, you know, to maybe wrap up with any last or final recommendations or even just, I also, you know what, I want to give you the opportunity to let your shoulders down, you know, and like to take a breath. So like, hey, I'm going to do that instead. Tell me what you're going to do tomorrow on your day off. How are you going to relax tomorrow? Besides so I found, so there's a show I'm watching on Netflix called 3% and I love it. Um, this is Brazilian show. You love it. FYI. Um, so I'm going to finish it off. I decided there's this little desolate beach area that nobody knows about. I'm going to go there for like an hour or two to just sit and be. I'm going to take my sound bowls out there. I'm going to eat pizza for lunch. Like I have a whole... I'm gonna go to the liquor store and buy some rum chata to drink in the evening. Like I have the whole day, like it's so planned out and I can't wait. I can't Good wait. You. Good for you. I had pizza for dinner. So, it, you know, it's the, fr it's the Friday thing. And today I also, I started the weekend the right way. My mom came over, we ate Chinese food. We watched a movie on Netflix. Like that's another thing I, I know in a pandemic, all of us don't have access to our family members in all the same way. Like my mom was five minutes away and we quarantine together so that's that's different but but it, i didn't see her all week and it mattered to just have my mommy today mm, you know I, what I'm saying? I do yeah <laughs> and so and i think we all need that and for the parents i'll close out with this parents please see your children as your friends mm. not just your children especially during this time there is an opportunity for our children to meet some of our own you know we're taught your kids shouldn't fill any of your needs well guess what right now while that's kind of all we have there is an opportunity to create some human need bonding so my daughter she's 13 it, it depends on the day but i have a son xavier one of my twins who literally if i did not have him to quarantine with since march i would feel so much more depleted because mm -hmm. he's my hugging, touching kid. He's the, I call him today, he said, hey, 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 Xavier, how you doing? Oh, I'm good, mommy, but how are you? And I told him today, he's eight. I said, do you know you are the one person in my life that still asks the question, oh. how was your day? How are you? Now there's people in my life who will, will find a way to just a normal share, but he's deliberate in his asking mm -hmm. and it matters. So just let your kids be your friends during this time too. I'll link an article that I saw an article today about um, actually seeking feedback from your kids um, and really being honest and listening to it. So I'll link it in the comments. Thank you to everyone who commented. I, go, I have to shout. We have to shout out Maria, who's all over Maria. If there's a if there's a hey, tribe, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's Maria, Tira, and I. And um, you know, I want to say hi to Marisol, Yolanda. My daughter, Beyonce, she is just saying hello to her mother, you know, and she said hi to your tia as well. So anyway, thank you, everyone. Um, Atira, yes, thank just, you. Yeah, you know. I, and I, I just want to say this publicly, you know this, but I love you and I miss you. And I can't wait till we can put our hazmat suit on and fly to one of our crazy um, states and take time. And now that the kids are going to be in school virtual, Nyla's plan is, well, we can just go out to aunties for a week or two. And you can work from there and we can school from there. So the real is that what she probably said is I, Nyla, can go to my auntie. No, no like mom, you can stay back. And the auntie's like, I think she knows I kind of have to come along. I kind of have to come along. So. Okay. I love you too and I miss you too. And you know, so I feel I feel like you got on my warm and fuzzy on the intro. So if you missed yes. it, I hope you'll listen to that. But I do. I love you. Yes, and hugs, hugs, hugs. You guys, she's the hugger, I'm the non-hugger. So um, when we, I know when I see you, we'll cuddle, we'll cuddle. Look, I told everybody in my life, I don't even care. If you non-toucher hugger people, when you see me for the first time, all the seven months worth of hugs. It is. It's going to, I'm going to be like, get ready. I, I'm, you know, all those hats for social distancing, I'm going to still wear them afterwards, but like with you. 
So, okay. All right. We have to stop and we don't want to. Um, so I just want to thank you so much. Um, I want to say thank you to everyone else for joining us this evening. Um, really fast though. Uh, you did tell people how they can reach you. So you're very Googleable. Um, oh that- yeah. So on Twitter, it's Dr. It's Kira Charles. So D R A T I R A Charles. Um, on Instagram, it's dr underscore Atira C. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. And then if you did want to buy my book, it's at ourmasks.com. So O-U-R-M-A-S-K-S dot com. And what we'll do is as soon as we're finished, I'll write everything down in the comment box. Yeah. So, okay. Good. So we are running over. Um, I want to thank all of you in the audience for watching us. Please continue to like and share the show and support the National Parents Union. Um, Next week, I will be on with Maria Paracano from the Siwapatli Collective. So have a beautiful weekend, everyone. I hope you do as many wonderful things as Dr. Charles recommended and plans to do for herself. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Have a great weekend, everybody.